Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. It's early Monday morning for week eight. Um, so the plan for this week is to go one dimension higher. So uh, already today I will talk about kind of a two dimensional version. We have seen those graphs, they're one dimensional object and I will wrap up the story about graphs. We'll come back to them later. But for now, kind of really the goal is that maybe one dimension is not very super exciting as a topological space. So graphs are really fantastic to encode kind of combinatorial data like train tracks or something. Uh, but maybe as a geometric object, they're not all that exciting. We studied the embeddings of them last time. That was already a little bit better. Um, but eventually we need to go on. And of course, if you have done dimension one, maybe the next natural st step would be uh, dimension two. And that's what I'm going to do, and it will be really, will be really, really nice. Um, so we'll study two-dimensional objects up to topological equivalence, and then we'll finally explain what that actually means. But before we go there, I will kind of, um, there's one more topic on graphs that I would like to mention, because it's, it, it's really amazing. It has a really beautiful answer. It's called Eulerian circuits or graphs or cycles. Remember, I'm not quite, never quite sure whether it's circuits or cycles. I will probably use both. And I will do that for the, let's say, first 20 minutes, and then we go to uh, two dimensions. And if you like graphs, don't worry, they will appear everywhere, so we will definitely come back to them anyway. But for now, um, I want to do the following notion. I will, I will have some fixed graph, and of course I will just pull up an example. I have some fixed graph, and I want to walk along my graph. Well, I'll just Take a, to take a tour in my graph, I take a pass in my graph, and I want to do it in a kind of a nice way. I have a certain type of question in mind. I would like to visit every vertex exactly once. Uh, sorry, every edge exactly once. Uh, so I'm walking along of my graph. I think of it like maybe um, a trail or something that I can walk along, uh, the, kind of along the shore of, of Sydney. Um, and I would like to, to visit everything. So I would like to visit every edge exactly once. But I don't want to go there twice, that's kind of boring. So I go there exactly once. And here's an example of such a path, um, which I've illustrated kind of step by step. So we start at this vertex here, and then we continue along the blue path. And the way this is done, as you can see, it visits every edge exactly once, and we end at this position. And this is not quite trivial, right? this is like a bit sophisticated, you go around. And I can easily draw a graph, um, okay, and I, I call a graph Eulerian, right? So this is called a Eulerian circle or Eulerian uh, circuit. Um, and I call a graph Eulerian if it admits such a cycle, okay? And I can, I will draw now, so this is an example of a Eulerian graph because I just showed you an example of a, of a cycle. But here's an example of a graph that is not Eulerian. If I just have two vertices and one edge, right? So the up, up, up to symmetry, we can imagine that we start, uh, sorry, uh, two vertices and let's say something like this. Something like this. And we start, let's say, at this vertex and we would like to take a tour around. Well, can we really do this? Um, I claim we can't, and we'll see later a good way to see that immediately. So let me just try. So let's try to take a trail here. So let's maybe we say we go here, we go here, we go here, we go here, and we go here. Um, so we visit everything <coughs> exactly once, but we haven't taken a, a, a cycle, right? We are, we are not back to where we started. I really want to cycle here. Um, fine. So question is, hmm, can we somewhat decide whether there is some nice trail on my graph or not? Is there any easy way of doing it? Is there, that's what you should always ask, right? We have some notion and maybe it makes some sense. We think of it as walking along and we don't want to do something twice. Um, can we somewhat decide a priori whether we can do it without, without really walking along and uh, taking the tour? doesn't seem to be completely obvious and this is how it actually came arose from so pe people were really trying to take walks 
so that my story is actually accurate. So Eulerian graphs are named after Euler. What a surprise. And Euler was, of course, a huge genius. And quite a while, while ago, um, people in Königsberg, so this is an old map of Königsberg, were asking the question, well, they had this nice island in the middle, and they had those little type of bridges here. So this is a bad color. Let me maybe take something brighter. So they have those little bridges here. And the question was, can you walk around uh, critics back, passing every bridge exactly once? Okay. Kind of was a popular game, and people tried. So um, non-mathematicians would just try. Right? And we are, what we are trying to do, we, find, we try to figure out a, a smart way of doing it without taking the walk. So people tried and failed. And so there was this open question whether it's actually possible. Um, and Euler was just very smart, and Euler just sat down and inv essentially invented graph theory and wrote down the corresponding graph, where every vertex is just one of those islands. So let me, let me mark them, maybe. So this one here is the island in the middle. Uh, this one here is this one. This one here is this one. And do I have another symbol, maybe a circle? This is this one here. And the bridges are the edges, right? That's exactly the question. And Euler thought about this. And Ola was really the type of person like, I'm, I'm going to think about it instead of walking around and trying to find a walk here uh, in Königsberg, whether it's possible or not, and came up with a ridiculously, ridiculously fabulous solution. Okay? So here's the solution. It's, it's absolutely uh, fabulous. And this was kind of the starting point of graph theory. So everything you see nowadays on graph theory was motivated by a kind of real world problem. Um, like people asking the question, actually, can we take a Sunday walk along Königsberg? Just visiting every edge, uh, every bridge, exactly once. Okay. And this is again a nice example of how graph theory kind of models a real world question. And Euler was really the first one who just said, okay, we just strip, strip out, uh, throw away all difficulties of the, the real world picture and just draw that thing here that we call a graph. And then we look at the graph and try to decide from the graph itself. And this is a really beautiful example of how graph theory should work in practice. You have a problem, and maybe whatever, you, there's a lot of difficulties. It's a real world problem. You just make a toy model with a graph. You solve it on the graph, and it tells you a lot uh, about the problem you started with. So Euler, obviously, uh, really much a genius. And it's a really beautiful theorem. It's what Euler wrote down, like what, in 1700 something, so if we have a graph, and let's just say it's connected, I try to convince you that, well, we can kind of do it per connected component. So let's just say it's connected, like on my example here, like sorry, this one, for example. Can we take a walk? Can we do this? And we don't want to do it just walking and trying. We want to have some easy criterion that we can check. And Euler says, there's a really simple criterion we can check. It's Eulerian, if and only if every vertex has, degree, uh, has even degree. So this is really easy to check, right? So um, before I show you the proof, let's have a look at the, this little example here. Well, let's say that we, could just, we just need to check now the, vertices, the degrees of the vertices. So we start here. We write down the 3. That's not an even number, so we're already done. It can't be Eulerian because every vertex has to be, to be of even degree. And we're already done without ever taking a walk which is an absolutely fantastic solution, right? So without ever trying, so people really tried and failed because it's not possible. And all I was just, OK, compute the degree here of this vertex. It's 3, so we can't do it. Done. Um, absolutely fantastic solution. And of course, then that works now for every graph. So you can imagine very different situations. And you can just need to check um, locally for each vertex what is the degree of the corresponding vertex, right? Absolutely fantastic theorem. Again, a kind of a global problem. Can we take a trail? Can we walk around visiting every edge exactly once? And the kind of a local property, and it turns out that they are the same. We only need to check it um, per vertex. Okay. And how can you see that? How, how should, why should you believe that this is true? Let me try to convince you. I'm kind of sketching the proof. I'm hoping to make it um, kind of very understandable. OK, so let's say we have at least one vertex of odd degree, right? So it's kind of the converse of what is up there. 
So there's at least one vertex of odd degree. Essentially, what should happen is we should get stuck in that vertex. Right? So we have a vertex. It has an odd number of outgoing edges, but you want to visit every edge exactly once. So you go out once. You will come in again. And you will go out again. And you will come in again. And you will go out again. Right? So I'm thinking about having a vertex. And it has some odd number of edges, but we need to visit every edge exactly once. So eventually, let's say we exit here, we come in here, we exit here, we come in here. Uh, sorry, I did it exactly the wrong way around. We come in here, we exit here, we come in here, uh, we exit here, and we come in here again, and we are somehow stuck at that vertex. Because I'm always going out and going in. I'm going out, I'm going in. So as soon as there is a vertex with odd degree, we somehow we, we are stuck. We will never be able to exit that vertex. And that's exactly what happens here. So let's say this vertex here. You will eventually come in, visit, taking this bridge. And let's say you're going out using this bridge, doing something. And then you need to come back. But then you're stuck on that island you, you, because you've already taken all other paths, or other possible paths. That's pretty brilliant. So Euler just said, OK, odd, sorry, even corresponds exactly to I go out and I go in. And odd, we just can't do it. You eventually get stuck um, going out and in, just always iterating that process. So um, down here, I have B with odd degree, for example, or C has odd degree. So eventually, we will get stuck um, at one of those vertices, because we go in. And event, we need to take something out, and we need to go in again. So that somewhat uh, can't work. Can't work, right? That's kind of one direction. And the other direction is a bit tricky. I wrote it down. It's not all that exciting, but I will kind of skip it. So the, the main crucial idea from Euler was really this going out and in as an even operation. So as soon as you have something odd, you eventually can't go out anymore. Right? You get stuck. OK. And we could ask the same question. So let me just draw a graph. Um, so here, this graph is not, it doesn't have a Eulerian cycle. Because if I start somewhere, I take that edge, I can't go back anymore. Right? It has always, every vertex here has um, odd degree. But it has an Eulerian path. So the Eulerian path is, this, I, I relax the condition of that I, uh, my start point doesn't need to be my end point. Fine. I could take a trail along the coast of Sydney without demanding that I end up where I started and still have seen everything. So in this case, this actually is, right? I can just go from here to here. So I have visited this edge. So this one um, has a Eulerian path. Okay. It's really just the same, but now we don't demand anymore that we start uh, and start point are the same. But still the same condition going through every edge exactly once. And you can easily convince yourself that if you believe the Puryear theorem, so Euler also worked on this version, so this works exactly if and only if, oh, whoops, this was bad, if and only if that essentially everything is odd degree, but you have two vertices, uh, sorry, everything is even degree, but you have two vertices of odd degree, which are exactly the start and the end point. Because let's do this again. If this is the start point and you have an odd number of outgoing edges, like, like five, then this is kind of perfect because you go out, you go in, you go out, you go in and you go out, but you don't want to go back anymore anyway because everything is visited already and kind of dually for the end vertex. So we have an Eulerian cycle if everything is even. And now we are kind of taking a walk, but we are breaking up the end point and the, the start point. They're different now. And now those two vertices have to be of odd degree. In particular, if you're asking the question, can I, can I take a Eulerian path? And where does it start? Where does it end? You're always sure where it starts and ends, because you just need to look for those um, two vertices. I have an example for you. I skipped the proof, but let's um, have our little example again of Königsberg. So here's a slightly different picture, maybe a bit easier to see. Uh, so the graph is still in the background. So what do we need to do? We need to decide whether this has Eulerian cycle or Eulerian paths. Okay. For the cycle, we just say, OK, C, C has vertex degree 3, so we are dead. Doesn't work. 
for, for a pass, we need to kind of write down a few more vertex degrees. So B has degree three, D has degree three, so we are dead. As soon as you find more than two vertices with an odd degree, it doesn't work. So this one has neither, so people really tried very hard, say it again, and Ola just said, oh, here's the solution. Um, this is neither a circle, a Eulerian circle, nor an Eulerian pass. Let me just write down the final degree, five, because everything is of odd degree. Okay, so there's neither. So there's no Eulerian cycle and there's no Eulerian pass. So what can we do if we want to uh, allow the people of Königsberg to take their to take their walk. So let's just say we remove this edge. So let's just say we destroy the bridge. And right now it looks a little bit different. And then this vertex degree jumps down to two. This one jumps down to four. So we have now precisely two of odd degree. So they should be the start and end point of a trail. It walks around and it perfectly works out. Okay. So whenever you have precisely two, you're good for a pass and it's precisely two odd vertices. And uh, for a circle, you really need to be everything to be even. I hope that makes some sense. Let me pull up the theorem again, or the corollary. They're kind of the same anyway, because it's really fantastic. So don't do the calculation. That's exactly what Euler said. Just check locally these conditions uh, on, on the vertices, which is somehow way more convenient than, if, imagine you have a graph with 10,000 vertices. and and well, 100,000 edges, instead of trying to find a pass that visits every edge once, you just need to check uh, a pretty simple condition in the end. That's an absolutely fabulous theorem. Hope it makes some sense. Cool. So we go to the next topic now. As I said, we will come back to graphs uh, eventually. They will appear everywhere. They're just, too, they're just too good as an object to ignore them. But eventually, we want to move on. So we want to move on to two dimensions, and I would like to explain to you before, kind of in general, what topologists actually study. For the graphs, that is a bit boring. That's why I haven't stressed it too much. But for two-dimensional objects, we kind of should be, uh, we kind of need to make sure that we know what we are talking about. And don't worry, I will make that very explicit. It's exactly this: you take clay in your hand and you, you model it using clay, but you need to write down a few functions because that's what mathematicians do. Eventually, I said again, this is coordinate free. Don't look too much at the coordinates. It's just a matter of you could do it, but you should really use your intuition and think of what happens if I have the object in my hand. Can I actually do this? And the key word is, can I do my deformations continuously? So you're not tearing it apart. That is a not, not a continuous operation, but just stretching or gluing, uh, stretching or um, massaging it a little bit, that certainly works. And the key word that we will use several times, again, jargon, careful, but we will use it, is a homeomorphism. Okay, fine, fair enough, that's the word. What is it? Um, homeomorphism. It's a function between two spaces, huh? some subsets of R to the M and R to the N. It's continuous, right? We want to do some deformations. And it has a continuous inverse. So essentially, you can whatever you do as a deformation, you can also undo it. Right? That's why we want um, this continuous inverse. And jargon again, we will call two spaces homeomorphic. Oh, very difficult name, homeomorphic. If there is a homeomorphism between them, yeah, fine. I will show you <coughs> several examples now because every definition is empty without examples, and hopefully, eventually, um, you get a really good intuition and a good feeling for this, and actually, you never need to revisit this definition really again. That's kind of my hope. And it's, it's really for, for it, it's, it's the same as for graphs, just a higher dimensional analog. So our correct um, identification for graphs was up to isomorphism, and here we just use a different jargon, put it in higher dimensions, and our correct identification is now Spaces are the same if they are homeomorphic. Okay. Yeah, I already said that. Um, just to convince ourselves, we can use the identity map from X to X. That's very good. That's continuous and shows that they are isomorphic. Um, if there's a map in one direction, then there's a map in the other direction because we already have the inverse specified as being G. 
which is continuous. And you can compose them. So I'm just saying it's an equivalence relation. I just can put everything in a nice uh, class. Hope that makes some sense. If I have a map from x to y and I have a map from y to z, I compose those two and I get a map from x to z. I can also do it the following way. If I have object A, I do my clay operations, I get object B, and then I do my clay operations on object B to get object C, and I just could compose my operations and do it right away from object A to object C. That's all I'm saying. And the first one is like, I don't do anything. That, that counts as an operation as well. We are very lazy sometimes, and not doing anything is always some more uh, very good. Okay, let me show you some examples formally, and then we go to the intuition part. So for example, and this one is really good, somewhat, um, all intervals of any length, they're all homeomorphic. In topology, we don't care about lengths. They're all the same. Whether my interval starts here, let's say at zero and goes to one, or whether it starts at minus 100 and goes to 10, they're the same. Okay? So we really don't care about lengths. It's very different from geometry. We don't care, but they're identified under our operation. And something similar holds in higher dimensions. I'm just writing it down in coordinates, so it's a bit easier to just do it for the intervals. And here's the map. It's really just rescaling. Fine. What is this map doing? Okay, so there's a coordinate version, and I really would like you not to look at the coordinate version, but I still need to write down a few coordinates. But anyway, I take my interval in my hand, and I stretch it. Either I push it in or push it out, depending on uh, the values of A and B. That's all what this function does. Pushing in and pushing out function. Well, and here's the inverse. And you can just, if you want, if you are up for the calculation, you can just check that they do uh, what I claim they do. But don't do it. So we are not looking at coordinates. I'm just, I'm just doing this. And really, all intervals are the same. So you can even turn them around. So if the endpoint is included on one side and not on the other, you just turn it around, and you get it from the other side. The only things that are not, so if the endpoints are not included, you can't do anything. And actually, it's even better. We can kind of stretch up to infinity. So the open interval is actually the same as R. How does it work? I think I will write down a, a kind of a coordinate version. But really, what, what it does, we take my our interval and we can just kind of stretch it as far as we want. And whatever the, the stretched out version is really just the real line. Let's see whether I try to write down coordinates. Um, by the previous one, it's kind of enough to show it for pi over 2. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you will see in a second why I'm using pi over 2. Because this map, uh, the, the tangent actually stretches it out. Right? It stretches out the interval between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2 up to an infinite line. There you go. And it's a continuous function, and its inverse is continuous as well. Fine. So that's how usually those maps look like. But really, the key is we think of this as taking those intervals in our hands and just stretch them or rearrange them because that's what topologists do. I will show you a few more coordinates, and then we will never see coordinates again. I promise you. Oh, this way. All right. The square is a circle, right? If you take it in our hand, if you think of it as being made out of Play-Doh, we uh, squeeze in the, uh, the corners and it will be round. So let's see how to do this. And jargon again, careful, I will denote the sphere, uh, sorry, the, the circle by S1. One is kind of the dimension and S stands for sphere. Okay. Um, what I show is, what I will do is, I will just rotate the picture, which is clearly a continuous operation with an inverse, and show that the square on its side is isomorphic, uh, homeomorphic to the disk, uh, sorry, to, to the sphere. And the map uh, that it does it is the following. So this, the, the left picture is given by that equation. If you think about it, the circle is given by x squared plus y squared equals 1. 
So the only thing you need to do is you need to take, you need to turn this equation into this equation, right? So the left equation into the right equation, and the map below does it. But what is it really doing? Is it kind of squeezes out the corners. So this map will take this little line and stretch it out until it is a little bit rounder. We'll take this little line, stretch it out until it's a little bit rounder, and so on. That's exactly what this map will do. Fine. So stretch it out, and it gets round. Will I do one more for you? Ah, here's the inverse. Okay. Um, you could do the same with the filling. So I'm, I'm hopefully this is kind of visible. So I sometimes think of them as being hollow. So I could punch through. The, the circle upstairs, but here I have a little filling in the middle, like, um, like really this is a disk, like a piece of paper, and I can't punch through my piece of paper. But the same argument will show um, that they are the same as well. Right? And the better argument is you take them in your hand, and you can just <laughs> stretch in the corners. Okay, I hope that makes some sense. Let's go back. Let's digest it a little bit. We had this one definition, which I recommend not to look too closely. Um, and it really is a mat mathematical formulation of what I'm trying to sell you all the time. And I will like, sound like a broken record. I will repeat this like a, a million times. I'm very sorry. That you take the object in your hand and you stretch it, or bend it, or rotate it. And this will realize all of this. And I just decided to show you some in coordinates. So this is a stretching map that stretches out intervals. You can even stretch intervals to infinity if you want. Stretch them away all the way to infinity. And you can kind of stretch out the, the square using this, the other map here. But I hope uh, nobody cares too much about coordinates because I don't. So we won't uh, see them too, many, too much often again. And really, I would like you to keep your intuition in, in mind. Should this be the same, take it in your hand, try to massage it, and see what comes out. And you will see, for example, that this one here, the empty one, and the filled one, that they cannot be the same. Why? Because if you have it in your hand, one is one-dimensional, just a line, and the other one is two-dimensional, so there's just no no way to get the, the uh, internal space. OK. That's a really good information here. Let me repeat that, because I haven't written it on a slide. And homeomorphism will preserve dimension. So a one-dimensional object cannot be homeomorphic to a two-dimensional object, or any other dimensional object. Okay. Right, so a graph, for example, is a one-dimensional object. It cannot be homeomorphic to a disk. Because a disk is a, this is a, this guy is called a disk. Disk is a two-dimensional object. I hope that makes some sense. Okay. So let's try another one. Um, let's take the sphere. So I, I will have a good picture in a second. Let's take the sphere. Okay. And that's the sphere. Remember, is always a hollow one, so I can grab through. And let's say I would be able to poke a hole into the, into the North Pole. I remove the, the point that I call infinity. It's just the North Pole of the sphere. Well, then it looks like I can just take it and bend it open into the line. And that's exactly right. So um, the, the, the process is very popular, very, very famous. And I will show you some nice uh, animation in a second. And it's called stereographic projection. Note that it doesn't show that the sphere is the real line, because I did a non-continuous operation. I poked the hole into the North Pole, and then I bent it open. It really shows that the sphere without the North Pole is um, the same as a real line. And this is exactly the, 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 the way how it works. So in order to determine where to map the point x, draw a line between x and the North Pole, and just draw it all the way down to the real line, and wherever it ends up, that's the image of my projection. Right? So this will, let me try, try to draw this. So let's say we want to know where this line goes. It's actually a really beautiful idea. You just draw a line between here 
and it will go to this point down here. And as you can imagine, all this goes up. This kind of goes all the way to infinity, because if I, oh, that's really difficult to draw, but let me just try. If my starting point is like here, like very close to the North Pole, then my connection line will be kind of almost parallel to the x-axis and goes out like very, very, very far. So the point will end up somewhere uh, behind, the, uh, behind me somewhere in the next room or something. And as you go closer to the North Pole, you kind of move those points to infinity. So you really get trace out the whole line in this way. Just imagine that you move those uh, lines through. And that's a continuous map. And this is a kind of a way better description than writing it down in coordinates, I think. Kind of really, really nice. You just move it around. It gives you a continuous map, um, which is called the stereographical projection. Cool. And we can do the same in two dimensions. So S2, I hope notation is reasonably clear. So S1 was a circle, and S2 is the hollow ball. So it's hollow inside, there's A inside. It's the, two the surface of the Earth. That's S2. And I claim the same works again. If you poke a hole into the North Pole, which is again infinity, you can take the little balloon you get and you just pull it open and now into the plane itself. So let's see how that works. Okay. Essentially, it's the same idea. But now I'm, I kind of have a little bit of a better illustration. So instead of drawing little rays, I just put a light source at the North Pole and I can track down um, the image of every point by, by just following the light source. That's exactly what I did before, just maybe now uh, in a slightly nicer way. So let me show you an animation. Okay, so here's a little light, and then now the light source goes to the, to the North Pole, and you can see it will track out uh, the plane. It's really, really beautiful. And this guy is called the stereographical projection. And you can imagine the things happening in higher dimensions. I just don't have a, a really good illustration anymore. Right, I have a little... Okay, let's go back. I could have done the same here, but somehow it doesn't really work in practice. Think of having a light source here. So where does this point go? Just follow uh, the ray through it. Hope that makes some sense. And this shows huh, that the ball without the point so you stick your finger upstairs and you bend it open, the ball without the point at the top is actually homeomorphic to uh, the plane. So topology is a lot of fun. As you can see. So kind of very strange, very different looking objects are actually uh, the same under this continuous uh, uh, clay type operation. Yeah. And people use that in practice so it, it comes from when, when you ever open a map, right? We have, we have the Earth, and the Earth is a sphere, fine. So you want to map the Earth onto something two-dimensional because you want it to have it on an atlas or something. That's exactly what people do. Um, just as a visualization exercise, what we could also do is we could try to put our light source in the middle, and we get a slightly uh, different projection, which has a different name. So depending on the atlas you read, you will usually see uh, either one of them. And as you can see, it kind of messes up a little bit uh, the real lengths and angles. Right? So Africa here gets very large because it ends up at the very bottom of the projection. But we don't care. We are topologists. We don't care about that. Um, also note that this picture is flipped around. Now my light source sits at the South Pole. But that's uh, trying to, I try to convince you that we can just turn our head and in topology. That's a totally legal operation, so that's the same anyway. And there are various other ones, so it depends a bit what kind of atlas you read, but always the idea is we kind of want to map our sphere onto the two-dimensional space because you want to put it in a book or maybe more modern on a screen. Um, and this is the way how people usually do it. You put a light source and you track uh, the rays of this light source. Cool. Awesome. So we want to study spaces up to this 
um, continuous deformation. And it kind of makes sense to start with one dimensional spaces, but we already did that. So we're going to two dimensional spaces next. Okay. Let me just pull up the picture once more. So what I showed you here is that homeomorphism is an absolutely beautiful idea, but it somehow identifies spaces where you I wouldn't expect them to be identified, like a sphere without a point and the plane, but it's like super useful because that's what people did anyway to, to write down maps and they still do. Because you kind of want to map a round object onto a flat object, but you can do that in topology and you can't somehow do that uh, in geometry because a round object is very different than uh, a flat object. Not from the viewpoint of topology. I hope that makes some sense. Then again, we want to, this is our equivalence relation. That's what we are going to use for almost the rest of the lecture. So we want to study spaces up to this equivalence relation. We did the one dimensional ones. If you think about it carefully, there was exactly the notion on graphs or isomorphisms. So we should go one step further. What is one step better than one dimension is two dimensions. And the objects you see are called surfaces. Right? The surface of the Earth is such an object. So a lot of surfaces from now on. So I hope you will like them. I think they are pretty cute. And I have some more animations for you to go. OK. But first, I show you the definition, and then I show you the examples. And the examples are actually better than the definition. But we want a subset of some space such that every point is locally has a neighborhood. I will have a, a picture for you that is a disk or equivalently any of those types, so a plane. So locally, huh, I'm, I'm just doing it for our little surface of the Earth. Locally, I'm standing here on my surface, and locally, everything looks like a disk. Right? Around me, I see that the surface of the Earth, which is down here, is a little disk. And I mimic that picture. And whenever that's possible, whenever locally something is flat, looks like a disk, that's what I call a surface. Don't read the definition. Let's just go to do some examples. OK, that's a disk. But a disk can look very differently because we're doing topology. These are also disks. Yeah? This one looks like a, I don't know what it looks like, but anyway, like a little settle. You can bend it like a disk, and you can just stretch this one out and get rid of the corners, and it's also a disk. A surface, that's something that's locally made out of disk. For example, what you see here right now is the surface, because I've drawn, just drawn a disk for you around one point. And maybe green is not a perfect color. Um, let me make it black. So I have one little point. I've drawn a disk around you, around it, and I could do that everywhere. So every point on my screen here has a disk neighborhood, and this was a shitty disk, but anyway, you will get the point. Some disk neighborhood. So this is the surface, as it should be, right? Surface is the surface. Uh, the plane is the surface. But we have way more sophisticated surfaces. This is surface as well. Around every point, so I'm not including the outside lines, but around every point I can still draw a little disk. Even if I go very close, because I can just draw a little disk. Uh, draw a disk everywhere. Yeah. And this guy has a name. It's called the annulus. So the top one also has a name. It's called the disk. And it also has a notation, D2. And the bottom one also has a notation, A. And I claim that you have seen the annulus before. It's just a cylinder. And so let's see whether you believe me that this is true. So what could we do? We could, so this is the annulus. And we now take it in our hands and bend it into, or I do it the other way around. I take a cylinder, that's the starting point, and you bend it down, and you get an annulus. And it's the same space that somehow goes under two different names. We take the top of a cylinder. Cylinder is really just a toilet paper roll. And you just bend it down, and you get an annulus. I hope that's reasonably clear. So that's what we are doing. And yes, you can write that down in coordinates. But no, I don't want you to do it. So I'm not going to do that anymore. Uh, so here's another picture of a cylinder. I took those two ends and I bended them down. And you will end up with that picture. I hope that's reasonably clear. Okay. 
So two surfaces that are already identified here, the disk and an annulus. Oh, good start. We have two of them. Um, the Earth, or the surface of the Earth. Note that I want a two-dimensional object. So this one is hollow. Okay. So everything I ever draw will be hollow un unless otherwise stated. So I could fill air inside. And it's a sphere, it's S2, it's the surface of the Earth. And again, every point has a local neighborhood that is a disk. You can play that game yourself. I can stand here again. I can draw a circle around me. Uh, and indeed, it works out very nicely. So here's another one. It's a sphere. Very good. This one, um, Taurus, uh, the swim ring. So it's hollow, so it's a swim ring. It has, you can draw a disc around every point. If you would have, we would have a swing ring right now, we could do it if you want. You could really just do that around every point. And remember, the disc is really just you can bend them, so it will have some curvature, but it doesn't, doesn't matter for a topologist. It's, those are all discs anyway. Okay, so. The real world object, so the, the sphere is really like a soccer ball, it's hollow. So it's not a bowling ball, it's a soccer ball, it's hollow. And the torus is not a donut, it's a swim ring, so I would be very disappointed if my donuts would be hollow. It's hollow, yeah, so it's a swim ring. So these objects really exist in real life. Um, and we can again, so if you're, if you're just looking at the soccer ball, then the pentagon here is already uh, a disk around any of those points in, within the pentagon. Kind of really, and here we can just draw our little disks. There you go. All right. So really studying real-world objects. Some of them kind of make sense in the real world. Say it again. The top one is not a bowling ball. It's hollow, and the bottom one is not a donut. It's hollow. It's a swim ring. Because we want to study two-dimensional objects, then it would be filled in the in, in, inside. It would be a three-dimensional object. It would occupy some space. If you're not doing that, it's hollow. So it's a soccer ball and uh, a swim ring. Okay, and then you think, okay, we have some kind of nice real world objects. So let me show you the cylinder again. It also appears like everywhere. So here's a picture of a cylinder. And this picture is actually pretty good because it identifies the cylinder and the annulus at the same time. So if you look through a cylinder, you can kind of see the projection to the annulus because you see the annulus out here. So the annulus is this flat one with a, with a uh, hole in the middle, and the cylinder is like this type of pipe thing. But they're the same, and you just look through it, and you can, you can see it. Right. So I hope you enjoy this picture. So we have seen a lot of real-world objects. Discs, of course, are like everywhere. Um, cylinders, pipes, soccer balls, uh, swim rings, whatever. They will appear in various disguises somewhere else. But maybe there are some more fancy surfaces. Because the only demanding thing we have is we have locally uh, neighborhood of the point. Okay. So a patch on your genes would be a disk neighborhood. So the genes is actually a surface. It is a surface with boundary. What do I mean by with boundary? Um, the boundary of a surface are those points that have half disks. We'll do that for you. So here, of course, the patch is just a disk around my point, but if I'm around here, I can only draw a half disk around it, so it has actually a boundary. So let me redraw the, the pair of pens in a slightly different way. So here in the middle, you have a perfect disk, your little patch. But if you would try to do a patch on the, on the ends of the legs or upstairs, you will realize that actually you can't do that. You can only draw a half disk, and that thing is called um, a boundary. Okay, so here, let's do that again. Let's go back. Here's no boundary. Everything has a disk. But here, for example, around our little disk itself, if you go to the boundary of the disk, you can only draw a half disk. So what we're really doing is we're studying surfaces that potentially have a boundary, as it's spelled out here, because around, you can either draw disks or half disks. Internal is a disk, and boundary is a half disk. But you still have... Um, plenty of real-world objects. So you, if you're very close right now, your clothes are surfaces. Kind of the point. Usually with boundary, um, unless your clothes are very fancy. Okay, so you wonder, eventually, okay, we have a lot of real-world objects, or pairs of pens, 
soccer balls, swim rings, whatever, pipes, whatever kind of things, um, is every surface of that type? And it turns out that the answer is no. And these are kind of the, the very interesting surfaces we are trying to understand um, as the lecture moves along. Here's a really difficult one. So this one will be nasty throughout, I promise you. But it is, and I don't have a good animation, it's really nasty. Um, it is a surface. It's a sphere. You take the sphere and you identify opposite points on the sphere. I will have some form of a picture later. But for now, it's just really difficult to imagine. But again, whenever you get out of this procedure, you identify opposite points. So moving around here is the same as moving around here. But again, what you do, because opposite points are very far away, you could still draw little disks around those points. They will just be kind of mimicked down here as well. But it's still a disk. It's kind of a little bit strange, because those, this type and this type is identified. Um, yeah, and this is called the real projective plane, or the topology version of the real projective plane. It's probably the most annoying space we will ever see. <laughs> yeah, so I don't, I don't expect you to understand it now. We will have a better picture of that space later. It's really just my first example that surfaces can get really complicated. And we kind of need some, as usual, we need some, some tools to understand them. I will have some better pictures for now. I just leave it as it is because it's very difficult. Yeah, right, exactly. So we try to find some ways to describe this space later. The only thing we know, it's already on our list, but you don't quite understand uh, what it is. And this is kind of a huge complexity jump from kind of real world objects to something that definitely doesn't exist in the real world. In mathematics, you sometimes do things that, that kind of don't really make sense in the real world, but they can turn up in abstract situations, and that's what we see here. And you have seen this space probably in geometry in, under, under the same name, but kind of differently formulated. And I will comment on that later. For now, I'll just say, this is a surface. This is a bit strange. It's a bit of a strange surface. Okay. A little bit of a nicer strange surface is a so-called Mobius strip. I have some animations of the Mobius strip for you. And you can actually build this one in real life. So here's this funny Mobius strip. It's a one-sided surface. Okay? So if I have my little ant walking around, you will see that it will always come back. It is here in the front, and it will see here in the back at the same time. So this is like a piece of paper where back and front are the same. It's a very strange object. I have another animation for you. It's called the Mobius strip. It's really a one-sided thing. So the ball rounds around and it will come up again. So it looks like it has two boundary cycles and two s surface faces, but it's really just one. Right? The ball goes around. It's kind of extremely fun to watch. And now it's at the back, and now it comes to the front again. Uh, a very strange space. And all of our energy will be kind of spent to try to understand uh, these slightly weird spaces. It was discovered really, really late. So you can build this in, in the real world, and I will do that next time. So this one actually does make sense in the real world. It just still doesn't appear. So nature doesn't uh, use that type of uh, shape, but you can do it. And people did it in the, in the 19th century. Here's my last one, and then we are good. So this is, again, a really strange surface. So let's play our little ant game again. So really, a surface is just something, if you think of yourself as being an ant, walking on the surface, that you can't, then you cannot distinguish it from a disk. Um, so this one is a surface. You can draw disk points around everything. But it's, again, a strange one. So now the ant is inside and will come out again. Mm -hmm. so does it actually have an inside or an outside? It's a bit weird. So now it's on the outside. And it will now move inwards. Now it's in the inside, and then it will go outwards again. It's a really strange object. And again, you will never find this anywhere in nature, but you can actually build it, and people did that. So you can, um, so this is a famous one. You can actually order them online if you want, 
and you get a glass version of them, um, so if you want. So you can really build them in, 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 in the space here. No, and we'll see actually what that means. However, not everything is a surface. For example, my little thing down here. So let's say we would have a local neighborhood where, like, like the, the binding of a book where three pages are glued together. With on a page, it's fine. I can draw a circle. I can draw a disk. But all along the binding, I can't draw a disk because I will always go to three different pages. So I can't draw a disk. So that's not a surface. The top one is not a surface because I can't, it's a bit difficult to see, but I can't draw a disk in the middle because there's this little cusp at um, the origin. Cool. And that's what I had today, so let me just wrap up. So we are essentially trying to understand the topological equivalence on two-dimensional objects. And what was my definition of a two-dimensional object? It's I can draw a circle around me. I'm a little ant on the surface. I draw a circle around me. And I can't distinguish it from a circle. I could distinguish it from a, uh, from a disk. I could distinguish it here. That's why this is not a surface. Um, and then we have seen like plenty of real world examples. So everything you wear right now should be a surface, unless you have something really fancy. Um, but there are also some more difficult things. I don't, still don't have a good illustration here. We'll see one later. And uh, there was this funny surface those two, where the ant was walking around, was going into the inside and the outside at the same time. So really, really uh, strange beasts. And we want to study those funny things up to uh, clay equivalents. So we kind of need to, need to say that they're all different because my intuition tells me this one shouldn't be a sphere, for example. It's just too, it's just too, too weird, too absurd. But we can't check that right now. Um, everything I listed, is really an own equivalence class on itself. So nothing I, I showed you in the last few slides, nothing is homeomorphic. They're all different spaces, but we can't decide that right now. So we need a method to do that, and that's exactly what kind of the rest of this week uh, will be about. Thank you so much. <laughs>